Hello there and welcome to the Hash Power Academy, your place to learn anything to do with Bitcoin. But the topic of today's video, as you can see, is not about Bitcoin. It's about the old money system, the debt based money system that we have today. Your pounds, your euros, your dollars, your yen, all of it. Fiat currency backed by nothing. Now, you may have heard that before, but this particular video is going through the three stages of realization of the potential problems that you may have with the traditional financial system and how it doesn't serve your best needs. I'm assuming that you work hard or at least try to. Whether you're happy with your job or not, time and energy has to be spent to make money and you have to put it somewhere and then you have to spend it. And that's your life. And that's fair enough. But the, the point of concern is three particular things. The money in the bank isn't yours. The money's not even in the bank and it's not money in the first place. So let's just go through these in process. The money in the bank isn't yours. Why is that a problem concern or a paradigm that should be important to you? Well, your bank balance is not some magical number of units that they've got stored in a piggy bank somewhere in a large vault in the back like any movie would show. No, 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 not anymore. Almost all of our money is digital to the point that when you go into the bank and ask to withdraw cash in the UK, they want you to give a reason why you're withdrawing it, uh, not do it on that same day because they've actually got to go and find another bank potentially that has the cash, and you need to justify your expense. So I remember seeing this viral video, this man wanted to withdraw several thousand pounds to buy his son a motorbike or something like that. And he said, well, I haven't bought the bike yet. And he's like, well, no, no, you need to go and find the bike. The bank, the person at the, the branch asked him to go and find the bike. Uh, I assume, quote the information of it, prove that he's going to buy a bike and then go to the bank to get the cap. It's an absolute nightmare. Our banking system is just wrapped in inefficient red tape to the extreme. But boiling it back down to this, the money in the bank isn't yours because you have to ask permission for it. The type of medium that you can access it is limited. You can't get cash out anymore. Uh, everything's through transactions with carbon accounting and surveillance and all these sorts of things. And uh, the grift of KYC and AML, anti-money laundering, which has created more uh, crime and attacks and theft from everyday people than it has protected them because they centrally collect everyone's information and then that gets hacked and now everyone's getting emails and spams and scams nonstop because the information was collected in the first place. But the key thing about the money in the bank not being yours is the fact that you've lent the money to the bank. It's not this relationship of them being entrusted with your money because it comes to this second bit. The money isn't even in the bank because the second you've lent the, the money to the bank, They've lent it out to all different sorts of loans to collect interest on it. The bank doesn't want to hold on to dollars or pounds or euros or yen because they depreciate. They know it depreciates. So why are you storing your time and energy in a bucket with a hole in it? And then the hole is leaking off into the defense sector and all other different government inefficient expenses. And this jumps to the third one, but we'll, we'll address this even more. The money isn't in the bank because they aren't required to hold the money in the bank. So you have a bank balance, which is a claim. And if too many claims come in at once, that's called a bank run. And then the bank's left in a position going, well, we don't have the money. It's, it's out there in the world. And that discrepancy means that you're shorthanded. Or to the other aspect of the government just papers over the problems and prints money. Now, why can they print money? Well, it's because fiat currency isn't really money, it's credit. It's a number in a database not attached to anything. If you pull out a paper note, such as uh, pound sterling, it will say, I promise to pay the bearer the sum of, and that used to be a quantity of metal. Our paper money was designed to be more transportable than heavy amounts of gold on a ship or whatnot, that we can now trade and transact in this layer two called fiat currency. And what they did was a bit like Ethereum. 
they disconnected themselves from the physical cost of issuing new money. Our paper money used to be backed by physical metals and that constrained things so that you couldn't inflate the money supply. And now we're in an environment where the money isn't money, it's not in the bank, and the money isn't even yours in the first place because you've lent it to them in a different sort of arrangement than them having custody of it and not doing anything with it. And all of these discrepancies boil down to you're locked in a contract, your employment contract. Is it 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100,000, let's say, dollars per year? So your time is being constrained and locked against the quantity of money. And if everyone's time and energy and their understanding of the value of money that, oh, I purchased something that was $100 and I work $20, $20 an hour, that thing cost me five hours of my time and probably six, seven, if you consider how much they take away and taxes and all these sorts of things. So people have this assigned value to work because um, work is work, it physically degrades you over time. And it's all our work is assigned to a quantity of money. And that's exactly what kids need and trust fund kids because they don't have that, that alignment of understanding the work and physical cost associated to the money if they're just handed it. And when you get this discrepancy that everyone in society now has their time and energy per hour or per year locked against quantities of money, it allows for the delusion for all of us to understand this perceptual perception of value of the money because it buys someone else's time and energy. You pay someone to, to work for you, whatnot. That's, what's, that's what sustains the delusion of the value of money because our money's not pegged to gold anymore. The value of the, the original exchange rate of our fiat money to gold is now at an extreme where gold is thousands of dollars an ounce when it used to be a few dollars. So the discrepancy there is not the timelessness of true money like gold, but the disconnection that our quantity of money that we've earned with our time and energy buys us less and less over time because there's more expansion because they're continually lending out. And the, the Keynesian economics side of this is let's expand the money supply so people can buy the things that they need and want, shall we say want more than need, and that that continual expansion is their way of justifying this increase in productivity that we see. Now, where things get across to the Bitcoin analogy is we don't expand the money supply. The, the units stay as 21 million, but those holding it, saving in it, they're the ones gaining value. And it's not, oh, I bought some Bitcoin and sit on my hands. You've got the other side of this, the Bitcoin network that's growing, developing, complexifying into different layers payment systems in traditional financial markets, the energy sector being monetized by Bitcoin mining, which is expanding the compute to reprice units in greater value, not quantity. Fiat is the other way around. They're continually expanding this quantity of fake numbers that your time and energy is locked against so that by the time you spend it after income tax, inflation during the time that you've saved it, and by the time you spend it, the sales tax and every other tax, and when you die, more tax. What amount of time and energy that we've earned through our work are we left with by the time that we spend it? And we wonder why everyone's chasing themselves and chasing their tails with fighting for income and being chased by their bills. Yet, yeah, the three stages of realization are the money in the bank isn't yours, it's not even in the bank, and it's not even money. I strongly recommend that if this is the start of your Bitcoin journey, delve into the journey from watts to sats. This is what we do here at the Hash Power Academy. You learn about the energy side first, which is the conversation to start anything in this world. Why energy is important. How can we get electrical bills down, stranded energy, all the way to the Bitcoin topic through compute power, the Hash Power Academy. So if that's the sort of educational environment, you can at least open up this perspective. Even if you disagree with what I've said, at least go and learn and explore the way the financial system works today. Because there's many people in the past that have said, I think I can't remember the person, but they said, 
if you under if if the masses understood how the financial system worked today, there would be a revolution by the morning. So raise your awareness, store your time and energy from your hard earned money that you worked for, whether swapping it into Bitcoin or being paid Bitcoin, not financial advice, but everyone that has done so has pros prospered handsomely for it when holding it over, say, multiple years, such as four plus a whole cycle. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.